to order the Wednesday, January 17th, 2018, Algonquin uh, North Forest Alpha Regional School Committee Open Meeting. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay. The first order of business is action on the minutes. Paul. I move that we approve the minutes from the North Forest Alpha Regional School Committee Open Meeting of December 20th, 2017, as submitted. Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan. Any comments, questions, corrections? <laughs> all right, then all those in favor? <coughs> up one, all those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Two abstentions. That passes. The next item on the agenda is, agenda is educational <coughs> policy and a few, and a few uh, permissions. Yes, Madam Chair, these are annual events. Our um, students are well preparing for their uh, Massachusetts All-State Music Festival, March 1st through the 3rd, and again for the Model UN Overnight Field Trip, two events that are celebrated here on campus each and every year. Um, the packets, uh, we've reviewed them, and they are complete. And important. Okay. Paul. I would agree. I think they are complete, and so I would, I would move that we approve <laughs> both of the, the overnight field trip requests that, that have been submitted tonight. Second. Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan to approve the overnight field trip to the Massachusetts All State Music Festival on March 3rd, 1 through, 1 through 3, 2018, and Model UN's overnight field trip to the UMass Model United Nations Conference March 9th through 11th, 2018. Any questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, on to new business. Interview of candidates to fulfill to fill the vacancy of Raj. Um, so uh, the candidates are in the anteroom, <laughs> uh, just so that uh, one didn't get um, one didn't get a preview of the questions to be asked because we wanted it to be a, you know, not to give anybody a unfair <coughs> advantage. And so um, we will bring out uh, so. As you guys have uh, know, uh, because Raj was a Northborough member of the school committee, then it's just going to be the Northborough members that vote on the um, on the vacancy on the, the person who they would like to fill the vacancy. Um, Joan, as a senior member of the Northborough contingent, is going to ask the questions, uh, and then when we're done, I guess we'll put them back in the answer. Yes, they're okay. well aware they will be sequestered <laughs> in the green room. Oh, he's sequestered <laughs> in the green room. Conversation yeah. takes place. Yes. Uh, so, um, and jump in if you disagree. Just so it was an apples to apples comparison to the for the two candidates, uh, Joan has prepared some questions um, based on the input that you guys have given me, and um, so I hesitate to have members ask them. Follow up questions because um, unless you're able to ask them the both of them, uh, then it becomes sort of an unfair amount of information one over the other. But I can be dissuaded. Um, how does everybody feel? No problem. <laughs> that, did, that sounds like a plan. The questions are fine. Questions are the questions. The are questions fine. are fine questions as are fine. is. So. Okay. Um, and obviously, if something <clears throat> comes up that's you know that we kind of feel like the whole committee probably would have the same question, then mm -hmm. obviously, you know, feel free to, okay. to the follow only, up. The only proviso would be maybe explain, could you explain that more? That would be the only question yeah. just to Incomplete amplify a point. Answers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair Other enough. Other than that, these are fine. Fair enough. Okay. So um, if somebody wants me to say explain more, just raise your hand and then I'll know that is the cue to go. Okay. For explain more. <clears throat> And just okay. for um, more information sharing, uh, I did share with them that the um, town of North Pro Assistant Clerk um, is with us this evening, and she's uh, come out here to join us to swear in the North, the newly elected North Pro member. Okay. And we, um, I did share with them that they are certainly invited to remain because they will have been officially sworn in for <coughs> the meeting, or if they didn't plan to remain, they're more than welcome to leave, and we would get back in touch with them to um, follow up on all that is about school committee and, and prepare for the next meeting. Okay. So they're both fine with that as well. All right, so the two candidates are Lauren Bailey and Hallie Burek. I don't know if that's how you pronounce her name. I'm sure she'll correct me. 
Um, so uh, just, I think we just decided to do um, alphabetical. So, so from, <laughs> and they're both Bs. Um, so uh, you want me to go I can, or you can do that. All right, you go right ahead. Oh, we'll see, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before I start the questions, okay. Please. What? I can introduce you. Okay. Well, whatever. Enjoy. What? However, you want to do it. Okay. <coughs> Hi, Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Um, my name is Kathleen Pileshko. I'm the chair of the Regional School Committee. Um, it's uh, uh, because we are two towns coming together on a regional school committee, uh, there's Southborough members and there's Northborough members. And because the gentleman who, um, uh, who decided to resign was a Northborough member, that means you're filling his post. Um, so the way our regional agreement was formulated, that means that just the Northborough members <coughs> of the committee are actually going to vote on the appointment. So, um, I'm, and I'm from Southborough. <laughs> so that being said, um, Joan Frank here is our senior member of the Northboro uh, contingent of the school committee. So um, we thought it was most appropriate if she would sort of conduct the interviews. So okay, with that, thank I'll you. turn it over to you. And I believe Matt put, you have a set of questions in front of you. So if you ever want to mark up or whatever you feel like for yourself. <clears throat> so Lauren, thank you for being here tonight to highlight your background and interest for becoming a Northboro member of the regional school committee. Can you just describe your involvement with the Northboro Southboro School District, such as committees or organizations that are school related that you have served on, and your skills or interest that will be most beneficial in your role as a committee member? Um, so, my recent, uh, um, recent president of Northboro, I just moved here about six months ago. Um, so, in terms of school involvement, um, I don't have any specifically with the Northboro Public School System. However, after school, uh, so I am a teacher. Um, after school, I work for a program called STEM Beginnings, um, which works at St. Bernadette School in Northboro. Um, and when I was at Apple Fest in the fall, I had many, um, uh, many people from Peasley and Z School coming up to me saying, we'd love to get STEM Beginnings into our school. So although I haven't had any direct relationship with the schools here in Northboro, I have been um, sort of putting out some signals about this company, STEM Beginnings, which teaches about STEM. Okay, thank you, and welcome to Northboro. Thank you so much. <coughs> You'll love it. Okay. Our regional school committee meetings are scheduled for the third Wednesday of every month. Do you have any time constraints or commitments that may impact your ability to attend these scheduled meetings from February to May of this year? No, free as a bird on Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Besides the uh, scheduled monthly meetings, we also have subcommittee meetings to work with the superintendent on budget, policy, and contract negotiations. These meetings occur at the superintendent's office during mutually agreed times, either during the day or evening. Can you highlight your skills or interests to serve on any of these subcommittees? Um, so I have an interest in policy. Um, I lived in Washington, D.C. for several years, um, learning about public health. And although I didn't focus on policy, being in Washington, D.C., the program itself really revolved around policy. I'd say that's where I got my real passion for um, learning more about policy, how it works, um, although although it sort of started at a community level as a younger child, it definitely grew as I became an adult in graduate school. So I would definitely be most interested in policy. Okay, great. Can I use extra help? <laughs> <laughs> Today's education provides many areas for citizens, parents, and even the students at the high school level to be involved in. What issue or issues regarding our schools, or even education in general, are you most passionate about? Um, I'm most passionate about two things. Um, technology, or STEM in general, really, um, which is a big buzzword these days, and um, special education, so being able to meet the needs 
of um, students of all abilities in our school system. Okay. And the last question. Thank you for your time that you afforded us tonight to learn about your interest in becoming a member of our school committee. At this time, I'd like to provide you with a few minutes for a closing statement or if there's anything else that you would like us to know about you. Thank you so much. Um, so as a recent resident of North Grove, I'm really excited to start to become um, a member of this community. Um, this is sort of a, a new chapter of my life. So I've sort of been living in different areas in Rhode Island, in Washington, D.C., closer to Boston, and now my fiance and I have bought a house here in North Grove. We chose this town because of the school system. Excuse me, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, so we did choose this town because of the wonderful school system. Um, he actually grew up in North Grove. Um, so uh, he knows very well uh, what a great educational system there is here in the town. Um, so that being said, um, having moved from DC, um, the first thing I, I really said was, you know, I, I know I'm moving away from DC. I love this uh, community, but I do want to be involved in local government, at least at some level throughout my life. Um, uh, I, I'm someone who definitely sees opportunities um, in connecting people with other people and connecting people with, with companies. Um, I've done that in the past. Um, I really enjoy talking with people and knowing more about what, what motivates them, what are the issues that are most passionate, what, that they're most passionate about. In fact, I was able to speak to one of my neighbors, my new neighbor of six months, um, who is a teacher at Algonquin. Um, and I, before this interview tonight, I was able to sit with her and talk to her about her passions, why she's a teacher at Algonquin, um, and also what are the issues that are most important to her as a teacher here at Algonquin. Um, and so, uh, although I don't know if that's necessarily part of the role as um, a committee member, it's definitely something that I'm passionate about as well. It always helps to be informed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <clears throat> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you very much for coming out on a night like this. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <clears throat> It's Hallie, right? Yes. How yeah. it? Okay. And how do you pronounce your last name? Burek. Burek. Okay. Um, I'm Kathleen Pleschko. I'm the chair of the regional school committee. Um, but because we are a regional school committee and we have both two towns that come together um, as a committee, a 10-member committee, here's five South Borough and five North Borough members, um, the way our regional agreement is structured, only the North Borough members are actually going to vote on a replacement for um, somebody who resigns. So that being said, um, Joan Frank is our uh, senior member of the North Borough contingent of our committee, so she is actually going to be the one to um, conduct the interview. So I'll turn it over to Joan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here tonight to highlight your background and interest for becoming a member, North Borough member of the North Borough South Borough School Committee. <clears throat> Can you just describe your involvement with the North Borough South Borough School District, such as any committees, organizations that are school related that you've served on and or your skills or interests that will be most beneficial to you in your role as a school committee member? Um, so I have not served on any uh, committees for or North Borough or South Borough. Uh, my children are still uh, very young, a three and a two year old, so I am not quite in the schools yet. Um, but my um, professionally, I am an assistant principal at a middle school um, in Stoughton. I'm in my fifth year. Uh, and prior to that, I was uh, a teacher for eight years. Um, so my, my passion, my interest, and my job kind of align. Um, I've done uh, a lot with um, the kids in, at the middle school. 
I would say my biggest uh, passion is really kind of champion for students who, who need it. Um, so those uh, who are struggling socially and emotionally, um, those who um, have, um, for whatever reason, are having difficulties in school. Um, one of the things that we're really working on this year is trying to bring um, outside community organizations into the school um, and trying to uh, work to uh, really better the, the whole community and the school uh, community. So we're trying to really work, work together to get new programs um, for, for different students. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Our regional school committee meetings are scheduled for the third Wednesday of each month. Do you have any time constraints or commitments that may impact your ability to attend these scheduled meetings from February to May of this year? I do not. <laughs> At this point in time, I do not. <clears throat> Besides the scheduled monthly meetings, we also have subcommittee meetings to work with the superintendent on budget, policy, and contract negotiations. These meetings occur at the superintendent's office during mutual agreed upon times during the day or evening. Can you highlight your skills or interests to serve on any of these subcommittees? I think my skills uh, go back to kind of just my experience uh, as being an administrator. So I've worked on uh, with, with other uh, principals and administrators in my current school system on those kinds of committees. Um, and I've, uh, I've worked to kind of put things into a contract or, or those kind of discussions. So this would be, it would be a learning curve for me really to be on the other side of it. Um, but I'm a fast learner um, and uh, it, it sounds like it, it's kind of a good challenge. Thank you. <clears throat> Today's education provides many areas for citizens, parents, and even the students here at the high school level to be involved. What issue or issues regarding our schools, or even education in general, are you most passionate about? Um, so as I kind of mentioned uh, prior, I, I really, what kind of interests me and, and um, a passion is really for kids who, who are struggling for whatever reason. That's kind of who I, I gravitate towards professionally. Uh, and, and obviously I'm, I'm there for all the students and all the parents and want to work together, but I really, um, like to kind of put in programs that are that are maybe going to uh, speak to those who who are, are, are looking for for something. So, like for example, uh, I am one of the driving members of a trauma committee. So we're really trying to educate our faculty about um, students who have experienced trauma and how that impacts students in the classroom. Um, I'm also trying to work on um, having some sort of empowerment group uh, in our school for, for girls. Um, so we've tried kind of like an anger management for kids uh, and that really wasn't very successful. So we're trying to look for some sort of meditation and some sort of yoga and some sort of uh, a, a different area. Uh, we're trying to get the, the police uh, to come into the school and, and do like a trivia every month with the kids. So that's kind of what I, I'm, I'm interested in really to do something what's, what's good for the kids, to try and bring more things in. Jessica Minahan was another person that I know that you guys had had her. I tried to make it that um, one of the nights that you guys had. But she, I was a driving force in bringing her to our full day PD. Um, and so that kind of is really what interests me. Thank you very much. Uh, Haley, thank you for your time. You afforded us here tonight to learn more about your interest in becoming a member of our school committee. At this time, I'd like to provide you with a few minutes for a closing statement. If there is anything else that you would like us to know about you. Um, just thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, this is my, well, my husband and I moved to the t uh, town for the education system uh, about six years ago. Um, and as I said, I have two little kids. We're not quite in the school systems yet, but I've been looking for a way to uh, kind of put my toe in to, to kind of give back to the community and to get more involved. And when this interim position uh, popped up, I was really excited because I have the background in education, which is something I absolutely love my job and I'm very passionate about. Um, and then this uh, being part of the, the school committee seemed to kind of work, work well together. So thank you and so much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on a night like this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Though it wasn't that bad, the superintendent made an excellent decision on the snow day. Yes, <laughs> she did. I know you don't vote, but you did make a good call. <laughs> <clears throat>
have a decision to make. <laughs> it's the royal we. The royal we. Um, so uh, why don't you also conduct the discussion? Okay. Um, I think it would be, even though Northborough members are the only ones who vote, I think it would be great to have the input of Southborough members to help us in our decision making. So we don't want to be alone. <laughs> so I'll open up for any discussion on the candidates. Dan? Um, so I'll, I'll start. Tough choice. I mean, yeah. honestly, I wish we had two positions. I wish this could afford it. Two commissions, <coughs> two, two positions. Um, mm -hmm. They're excellent. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the committee can't go wrong. I, um, if, if I had to say, I thought the um, second candidate was stronger in terms of the background that she would bring um, already being in a uh, school system. And, and you know, we deal a lot with policy, with budgets. I'm confident that that. Um, you know, she, you know, would bring that level of experience from a middle school perspective, but that would probably be additionally beneficial. Um, the other candidate, I love the, the passion on STEM, and I think that was, you know, she would be excellent as well. So it's, mm -hmm. it really is, you know, I, I look forward to hearing your discussion and your vote. <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a tough choice, too, but I would echo Dan. I think we go with the experience. I would I would suggest that that the second candidate, I thought, just brought a little bit more to the table. Um, you know, she's been involved in the administration of, of schools. She kind of, you know, that's she knows how it works, I think, mm -hmm. certainly more than the, the first candidate who would be, you know, who certainly doesn't seem like she'd have a hard time learning it, but she'd right. have to learn it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the second candidate, if you picked it, would hit the ground running. Okay, thank you. I, um, I agree that the second candidate has a lot of experience, but I'm kind of, I would lean more towards the first one because of her passion. She's only been here six months. Mm -hmm. She's already trying to get involved in the, um, in the community, and I think she would um, maybe be a little more involved because of that, because she, she really wants to, to be involved. Mm. Sure. Kathleen? So I'm going to speak from uh, ex the experience of somebody who came into being a school committee member with absolutely no educational background at all, except for being a parent, which is no educational background. <laughs> um, and uh, just because of the position that the committee is in, in that this is really a term that we're appointing only until May, um, it took me a long time to really get up to speed of the nuances of all the decisions that we kind of have to make. And um, so, so two things. Because of that, I think it is probably prudent to uh, choose, because they're both great, to choose a candidate that can hit the ground running because it's really only three months. Um, and, and the second, uh, my, my second piece of input is that uh, in my 10 years of dealing with this, anytime there has been a situation where there's two candidates that um, are interested in a position on a school committee, all they have to do is wait, and the, 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 you know, the first one will get chosen, and the second one ultimately ends up on the committee in some number of months or years or whatever it is. Um, because like you said, that passion doesn't go away. And, um, and there's, it, this is not, is like, this not, is it not a one and done. This is just for three months, and then, there's going to be ample opportunities. So I, I think, honestly, that we'll eventually get them both. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not worried about uh, you know, losing one with more passion or, or one with more experience. And, but I think that for now, uh, it would be prudent to, to take the one that has the educational background. Lynn? Um, I was, I, when I was sitting here, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? This is so good. And they each have their own things. And if, I mean, if you're thinking about, you know, it's a three-month appointment, I mean, they can choose to run for re-election if they like it. Um, but the things that we're going to be dealing with is, like, the budget, I mean, a lot of end-of-the-year stuff. And in order for, like, the candidate to be, um, to get the most out of that person and not just have them kind of sitting here learning, like, and be able to contribute to the budgetary discussions and things, I think someone with a background that already kind of knows because I was like you I mean I I had family members who were teachers so that was like you know the 
close as I was, but I was a black sheep and wasn't <laughs> in education at all. So, um, and uh, so I <clears throat> understand that, but like when you have like a three year term to kind of get into it, it's, you know, it's, you can do it. But, you know, um, I think to get the most value out of the person, um, I think the, the second, um, the Halley would, would be for this purpose, but they're both great. And um, as you said, Kathleen, um, they're not, go, you know, not going away. I don't think um, <clears throat> the first candidate is going away. I mean, she'll, she'll find something. I'm sure there's always people that don't, you know, seek re-election or other opportunities too. So, um, but they're both great and they would both be valuable um, to the committee just in this particular instance. Jack? I agree that this is a unique situation that it really is a three month appointment mm -hmm. and that the second candidate for that short term fits that very, very well. I would also say that one of the notes that I wrote down uh, for Lauren, the first candidate was, she'd be a great candidate for the K-8 in Northborough. Policy, STEM, all the all the mm -hmm. things that, that I'm passionate about that we deal with at the K-8 level, she'd fit right in. So, again, you kind of alluded to it that, you know, once they've indicated a willingness and a passion to work with the schools, that just doesn't go away. Get on a ballot and I'm sure we'll be seeing her again. So. Any other comments? Um, I like to say that Lauren, I was impressed with her, their policy. There's two things, the school committee, school committee from Ed Reform were in charge of policy and the uh, hiring and the uh, application and the, um, and at the end of the year um, evaluation of the superintendent. So that was, a, that was the strength of hers. I was glad to see that both of the candidates are involved in the community and a great addition to Northboro and Southboro. Uh, but then when I look at the time of the year we are and piggyback on what Kathleen said, we're in the midstream and I know regional, the first time you come is just like daunting, you know, like what's going on and who says this and voting and everything. Uh, but I think with Hallie's background, where we are, like we're having the first preliminary discussion of our budget tonight, she's familiar with budgets, she's probably familiar with the uh, school councils, the uh, school improvement plans and everything that goes into the makeup of it. Now she's at the middle school, so she has some experience there coming in to go to the high school. So I think out of both of them, I think that Haley, for this time where we are, would be an excellent fit. I think both of them will be great for the community and I'm so pleased to see their involvement as new residents in Northbrook. Okay. So at this time I'd like I to close that discussion. And Jack? <laughs> okay, so we have a motion. Is there a second to? Continue with the voting, Lynn? Okay, so is there a motion? I move. Chat? That we vote for. for. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, we vote, that, we vote, that we vote for the second candidate, Hallie Burak. Okay. Is there a second? A second? Check, second by Lynn. Any other nominations? All those in favor of. Um, Voting for Haley to be on the school committee for the Northboro Southboro Regional as a Northboro school committee member, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, passes unanimous, four to zero. Okay, then we have a new member. And would the committee like to share any parting thoughts with Lauren, or shall I just thank her and send her on her way? No, 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 no. no, no. no. Well, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> No, Jack's already got her on Northboro Regional. <laughs> <laughs> I've got her on as a KDA, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When are papers available for the Northboro KDA ballot? Okay. Oh, wow. No, oh, great timing. my papers. Uh, <laughs> 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 you need me to take a page? I'll take it. Here, you, you, you sway me. Oh, because I have no educational background. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you reminded me exactly. how, you know, it, it, it is, you know. It's daunting. Even still it's, now. Yes. So. Yeah. Especially a combined meeting. Right. It takes a while. Yeah, yeah it yeah, does. Mm -hmm. Even when you're with it, a combined meeting, it's weird. <laughs> it does. Do we tell the vote or do they know or not? I did not share that. I thought okay. you might share that, but I did extend that gratitude and uh, did share that there's always openings, particularly in K-8. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, and then you can finish. Sure. Uh, Lauren and Haley, we'd like to thank both of you. We're very impressed by both of your credentials and your background and more so even by your enthusiasm and what a wonderful representation you would make, both of you, onto the committees. And I think in some of our discussion that came across, unfortunately, we hoped we, you know, we don't have two positions, we only have one position tonight. That's tonight. And May is right around the corner, <laughs> even though there's snow on the ground. So, I mean, some of the discussion that came up is that you're two wonderful candidates, and even the one who would not be selected tonight, you already have the endorsement of the committee, to go and get your papers. We even checked with the town clerk. <laughs> papers for the North Road K-8 and the regional are going to be available next week. So we'd love to have both of you to be in our midst and to help us as we do policy and we do budget. And um, so we'd like to thank you for the time, for the wonderful presentation, and also the resume that you shared with us and your involvement. We would love to work with both of you. Um, so the, uh, just because of the situation of the timing of where we are, um, uh, we have a lot of heavy topics that are coming up in the, um, in the next few months. And so it was primarily just because of that reason that um, we decided that Hallie would be a better fit because of the time. But we do not want to dissuade you <laughs> <laughs> from, because, because that's truly what's like the major issue because we everybody loves you both. So um, uh, you'll be wanting to talk to Jack Kane there <laughs> 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 because he's on the Northboro K-8 and um, envisions a lovely fit with the K-8 um, uh, school committee and you. So please, like I said, don't get discouraged. Do not take this as you know in a, in a front of anything like that. Uh, we'd love to have you both, but um, because of your experience as being an administrator, it would just there's so much to learn. It's like drinking from a fire hose. You know, I mentioned that I didn't have any kind of educational background and it took me a full year to get up to speed on all this stuff. And being a regional uh, committee in a regional district, it's even that much more complex. So um, a three-year term is probably perfect for that because then you can really, you know, take your time and, and get up to speed and have more of a, of a, um, Calm, cool, and collected <laughs> uh, inter, um, in introduction to, uh, to the school system. But we really, really hope that you do do that. And um, we have the assistant town administrator who, town clerk. sorry, town clerk, clerk. sorry, town clerk. sorry, town clerk. Um, so if Hallie, you are interested in even staying at this meeting tonight, we can get you. Um, sworn in. Sworn in right now. <laughs> I don't know. I know exactly. I don't know if that was your intent, and, if, and we totally understand if you know. You probably said, "Oh, I'll be an hour." <laughs> um, on the flip side, uh, except for budget discussion, it's not that heavy of an agenda, so we shouldn't be very late. So, um, but in in either event, you should get sworn in right now because that will save you a trip to the to the uh, yeah. But Lauren, thank you very very much. And no, no, go ahead. And, uh, <laughs> and like I said, please don't, you know, don't get discouraged. Don't take this as a, yes, absolutely. Oh, you can stay for the and you can stay in the audience for the rest of the meeting, absolutely. You can come to any meeting you like. <laughs> <laughs>
Alrighty. Where are we? Oh, yes, Paul. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry I called you by the wrong title. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next item on the agenda is the update on athletics. We're very fortunate to have uh, A.D. Witten with us, a familiar face. And uh, last year, at the end of the year, we talked about the importance of having uh, sort of seasonal updates um, with, uh, from our athletic director. And Fran, is, uh, this is his second appearance with us, fall sports over and uh, winter and midstream and preparing for spring season. So Fran will provide an update on all of the uh, wonderful activities that have been taking place with athletics this year. And, and certainly there has been a lot of activity. So. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the <clears throat> fall season. Uh, our participation in the fall was up by 8%, which is really substantial. I would to say 4% of that was because of the addition of our unified basketball program. But that being said, uh, it was an 8% increase overall in participation in fall athletics. Uh, tournament participation, welcome. <laughs> My name is Trent Whitten, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, our tournament participation, both our boys and girls cross country teams qualify for tournament and we really, I, I don't often point out individuals because we really firmly believe that it's about team, but when you have an individual of the caliber of Tess Reyes, mm -hmm. She really deserves mention. Tess had an unbelievable year for us in cross country. She set our course record. She set league records. She qualified for districts. She went to states as an individual. She really just had an incredible year. And, and the amount of hard work that it takes to, to reach that level, I felt was worthy of mention. Um, some of our other teams that qualified for tournament play were both boys and girls soccer. And we also had two Division I sectional champions this year our girls field hockey team, and our boys golf team. Uh, I do also think it's important to mention with our boys golf team that they went on to play in the States. And for the third time, they came in third place at the States. But I think it's important to mention that they were the first public school. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of discussion at the MIAA, the governing body for athletics, and, and where the Marlin Catholics, Catholic Memorials, St. John's should really fit in all of this. But I felt it significant that three times now our boys golf team has made it to the Division I state tournament and come in third place. But they're the number one public school in the state those three times. Uh, the program, the t of the Month that I brought back, uh, continues to recognize outstanding student athletes, but more for their demonstration of leadership, teamwork, in sportsmanship than necessarily in an excellent performance on the field of play. I, it's a little bit of both, like Tommy Ackle, who plays on our boys' hockey team, um, scored the winning goal in double overtime at the Burroughs Cup. But at the same time, he's an unbelievable person. He's, he's a captain on the team, he's a leader, he exhibits sportsmanship, he's the hottest worker in practice. So it, it's a combination of things where I um, take nominations from the coaches and also based upon my own observations where I pick kids each month to receive t -Hawk of the Month. They get a certificate and a pin that I hope they proudly wear on their backpacks, but you know. Um, the Thanksgiving Day pep rally this year was, was awesome. Um, it's the best one I've witnessed. It was, it was fun, it was exciting, and it was all-inclusive. Uh, Renee Moulton, who's a faculty member, really was instrumental in putting it together. And I felt the thing that was really significant about it was it wasn't, it wasn't just about football. And I, I don't mean to put football down. I love football. Thanksgiving Day is awesome. But this pep rally, pep rally recognized football. It also recognized all our other fall sports teams. It also talked about what's coming up in the winter. It also had uh, academic awards at the pep rally. It had performances at the pep rally from our fine arts program. So it really, it was a celebration of the school. I don't even know if pep rally is the right word for it anymore. It, it was just a great event, and I, I, I think Renee did a fantastic job putting that together. That was shortly followed by our Hall of Fame induction class, which I mentioned to you. It was upcoming at our last meeting, 
but the event itself was great. It was here at the high school, and to see some of these inductees come back, they don't even know where they are in the building. You know, they're trying to figure out, okay, this is the cafeteria, so what happened to the gym? And, you know, and members of the athletic council gave them tours. They got to see their plaques hanging in the lobby. Uh, it was just a great day, and the emotions, the, the two women that talked about the school committee talked about passion. Um, the passion and emotion that these inductees demonstrate for the tradition and the legacy that is Algonquin is really unheralded. It's, it's a great day. Um, I mentioned already the addition of our unified basketball team. It was a great program. It was a wonderful experience for all involved. To see the gym packed with kids from our other sports teams coming to the unified basketball games and cheering these kids on, it was, it was just a really rewarding experience for all involved. Um, the Athletic Council, which I brought back, continues to be active in, in empowering our student athletes. Uh, what I want them to do is I want them to feel empowered in the athletic department and invested in the athletic department. So currently we're looking at some initiatives, initiatives to enhance school spirit and good sportsmanship, uh, community service, and most importantly we're looking at the formation of team contracts, which leads into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is our captain's breakfast. Each season I have a captain's breakfast. Fall captain's breakfast already took place. Winter captain's breakfast is towards the end of the month. We'll have one in the spring as well. And uh, um, a strong number of the captains are also on the athletic council. And what we're working on is the formation of team contracts where the teams are going to contract with each other in terms of working with each other and helping each other make good decisions, keeping each other disciplined, keeping each other committed, and making sure that when as a team member they're faced with a difficult situation or what could be uh, a poor choice, their team is there to support them and help them out in that situation. So we're, we're moving forward with that. I do also want to thank the Booster Club for their continued support. Uh, the t-shirts that I talked to you about that we issued to all fall athletes have now been issued to almost all of the winter athletes as well. There's a couple of teams that I still have to catch up to because they're, they're off campus, so I can't just run into the gym or pull them to the side. But we've got almost all those t-shirts out to our winter athletes, and then, of course, they'll be going out to our spring athletes as well. Uh, talk about the winter. Our participation for the winter season is up by 4%. That remained consistent with the fall, where we're seeing more kids participate. All the teams are off to a great start. Uh, we have a special event. I think it's still on the board out front. Uh, there's an invitational at the TD Garden in Boston. It isn't a tournament in terms of like we qualify for sectional tournaments. It's, a, it's an invitational. And uh, Westwood Academy invited us. We were scheduled to play that anyways. Uh, they got an offer to go they invited us to be their opponent. So on January 27th at 12.30 in the afternoon, our boys basketball team will be participating in this invitational at the T T Garden, which is pretty exciting for the kids to get to, to play on the garden floor. Uh, <clears throat> and then, um, as always, you know, there are people that I'd like to extend my thanks to. Uh, support from the central office and the administrative team. Uh, Mark Carey, who works for Silly's, who did an unbelievable job this, this fall keeping the fields up and running and lying, and he treats them like it's his own backyard, and they, they really look beautiful, and a lot of people commented on it. Uh, John Briscoe, our athletic trainer, uh, my superb coaching staff, and uh, of course, um, Susan Burns, who's my administrative assistant, but really much more than that. Uh, and then, of course, the, the reason we're all here is for the kids. We just have the greatest student athletes there are to have. It's, it's just a wonderful group of kids, and they're, they're a pleasure to work with. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Jack? I just wanted to um, kind of amplify one of the points that, that Fran made about the Hall of Fame ceremony. Um, I had the honor of giving a speech on behalf of the first uh, winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award, a gentleman by the name of Chet Leonard who taught um, and was a counselor in the school systems of Northborough for decades. Um, 
been a tremendous member of the community, um, and his life, you know, was celebrated there and got a standing ovation. It was, it was a, again, the best part of the day for me. Um, the people that are on the, the committee, we're, we're going to be looking for some South Borough people to nominate, so please keep that in mind uh, coming up in a couple of years. The other thing that came out of that um, day was a commitment from our superintendent to get it to her field, that it's, it's time. So that's going to be something that's going to be on the agenda of the regional committee uh, moving forward. And we're looking forward to many discussions about how to, uh, to make that happen. I'm sure there'll be a subcommittee form for, for that at some time. I'm looking at Fran because okay. uh, <laughs> Fran has invited me to, um, I think we have a double header on Monday night, uh, one in Southborough and also the booster organization. So I, I know we took this up for conversation last month about the importance of engaging the community and the booster organization in our um, purposeful intent to sort of get off the ground an initiative that would help us uh, look at what it would mean to enhance our athletic complex and to do that in a very collaborative way so that it's not just a one article that we're looking for. And I know that we've been talking about this for some time in regional policy and in regional subcommittee, appreciating the magnitude of the task. And so Monday night, Fran, one's at 7, one's at 7.30. Correct. Um, we will be in Southboro um, discussing the use of the Algonquin fields in the um, in the absence of uh, accessibility to the 9-11 fields in Southboro, and then uh, the booster organization has invited us to attend. So we'll be talking a little bit more about this with the booster organization, and we had an opportunity to talk with some folks at the um, Hall of Fame event in November, which was fantastic. And really the enthusiasm from the organization to um, rally around behind this discussion uh, it's very, very much in the infancy stage. We talked about this last week, month in terms of the capital project and whether do we do the repairs or do we launch this initiative. So it won't be realized certainly overnight, but there's certainly committed people in our community that I'm sure will be very dedicated and um, interested in the challenge and the conversation. So it begins Monday, I think, when we uh, attend the booster meeting. And more information to follow with their reaction. Um, and their support and probably their wisdom at the next meeting. Uh, Jim Forbush was here in um, September, I believe, and we also mentioned that we wanted to continue the dialogue with them. They provide so much support for our athletic budget. I do have to give uh, kudos to Fran. Uh, we do have, uh, we did sit down and to Dr. Walsh, we sat down and actually put together an athletic budget, which we'll see a little bit more of uh, when I talk about the preliminary budget. And uh, so we've got some talking points also when we talk with the booster organization. You know, we invested a lot of time with that. Joe. Um, i just like to highlight on one thing that I think was really great was the fall pep rally. Not being there, but just hearing what it was. I think it was a showcase of the best of the best. And knowing how I think it would be so beneficial probably for the freshmen or somebody else who may have heard of an organization that they want to do if it was the fine arts or something, but it could have piqued an interest, somebody who is – you know, new to Algonquin, even if it was a move-in for freshman or soft, uh, sophomore or junior. And I'm sure that that made them feel inclusive. So I was glad to see that under the pep rally term, we became inclusive of all the best of the best of Algonquin. So and kudos to you for everything you've done. So thank you very much. I just have to give back a term that I'm not sure if it's a Native American term, Fran, that you as a tomahawk, a true tomahawk, and an Algonquin, <laughs> most spirited, but he calls himself the Iota. And it really means I am only the interim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's been saying that annoyingly so on a regular basis, but I think Fran has been anything but. Um, I had the good fortune of working with Fran way too many years ago when uh, he was an assistant, uh, when you were an AD and I was an assistant. And um, that same passion and that same level of enthusiasm for all um, that's good for our kids is ever present. So you may just be an iota, but uh, <laughs> you've gone uh, full tilt since you've been back as interim, and it's very much appreciated. And also with uh, Sarah's enthusiastic support, 
it's been now one dynamic duo this year trying to stay up <coughs> with all that they're doing so <laughs> thank you for bringing that energy thank you to the interim position well, question um, who is the meeting with in Southboro on Monday um, Doreen Ferguson Doreen Ferguson and what? other Southboro uh, I think primarily youth programs mm -hmm. and anyone who's impacted by the fact that the 9-11 turf field is now offline so I, I think that what they're trying to do is figure out where they're going to fit mm -hmm. all these programs with without the utilization of that field so Doreen Ferguson tried to pull together all the groups that are invested or impacted by that decision. I think she, if I might, she's very proactive. Uh, I think she wants to make sure that everybody has a place to play when they want to play, particularly lacrosse and soccer. And so I think she's just proactively seeking input from us in terms of accessibility, what are our priorities <coughs> for our own athletes here, and then, you know, what are the shared costs in that experience. So it's a good time while the snow is still on the ground. Mm -hmm have the conversations yes well thank you very much for the update thank you for um, everything that you're doing to set the stage for a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the future <laughs> thank you thanks Frank. thanks Frank. <laughs> okay moving on to the exciting superintendent's report to the committee well, I'm not sure how exciting my report is, but I definitely know that Dr. Walsh has an exciting uh, report and has, uh, again, um, this month, a lot to share about all that's taking place at the high school. So I know we're, ex we're uh, looking forward to an update. Yes, thank you. And thank you for being here this evening. Um, I want to start right with academics. A shout out to our science department. I love their innovativeness. So in two different parts of the principal report, you'll see I focused on how our AP Biology reviewed 20 chapters in a gingerbread contest. Instead of just plugging and chugging through 20 different chapters, they found a way to make this kind of inner class competition. And the, all of the administrators visited, we voted on the winning gingerbread. I, having a science and math background for teaching, was completely enthralled by all of it. And it's just exciting to see our educators make our students' ideas come to fruition. And the same concept of innovativeness was seen in Ms. Zanini's class where she did a redox reaction and created like mirrored holiday decorations. And so the kiddos didn't quite understand that they'd be doing some major calculations the very next day on how those redox reactions work. So she sucked them right in. But the creativeness behind it, and they just got to leave with their treasure. And there were some couple of failed attempts that they learned from their attempts on how to actually really remember redox, which is great for their future applications. Um, shout out to our jazz band. They have a great symposium coming up with Westboro High School on Saturday the 27th. So Saturday the 27th is a big day for us. We have the TD Garden Game, and we also have our jazz band performing. We had a phenomenal Holocaust and human behavior in school field trip where we had one of the Holocaust survivors come in. Um, it was brought to us through supports of Facing History and ourselves in which the, um, the students were able to engage with the conversation and the history and how it applies to their life now. And I kind of gave a little recap of it. It was very empowering for our children to see the words of the text and the things that they are studying come to life in front of them. And it was just a wonderful event to have them participate here in our own school. It was like, you know, in school field trip, but coming to life for them. So that was super exciting. We attended the Superintendent Scholar Awards ceremony uh, just uh, last week, I believe, which was exciting because I was able to sit there and have a lengthy conversation with our, our two recipients, Laura Shi and Alex Shen, about their future endeavors. And that afternoon, Alex had a Skype interview with Berkeley on a specialized college program that he was trying to get into. And it just speaks to the excellence of our children. So not only is he at this event and, and being honored, that afternoon he's already got his plate scheduled on his next challenge. And he was sitting there talking to Laura and they were brainstorming with some of the other students uh, from the local high school. So it was fun to be part of that event. In athletics, Fran did a wonderful job recapping athletics. I wanted to point out that the work in athletics, I recaptured everything that Fran had said below because I love to put in print. It's actually exciting for me to read it over and over again. But it goes so much further than that. For example, I just visited the gymnastics meet and it's amazing to see our students up in the stands here on somewhat New England-ish winter night cheering the floor routines on, cheering for each other. So, and, and I don't, 
um, there they are cheering next to, you know, parents, community members. Stands were full. That's really exciting. They didn't sneak that. I, they didn't see that I snuck in the corner. And they're also cheering for the other school. It just shows that that T-Hawk pride is, is thick and it's ingrained in the work that's going on. And that the work that Student Council are doing is, is paying for it and having some positive, positive impacts. Um, for activities and clubs, shout out to our library. They have quite a few different updates on here. One of them is that they're doing their own speaker series and it continues that they're bringing City Year in for March. And what's fun about this is it does a lot of community engagement, talks about AmeriCorps, and just helps empower our children to make the choices that they want in getting engaged in some different community events beyond Algonquin's walls. And there they can practice a lot of the application that they're learning in the classroom a lifetime. Our B Club, I did a little recap on our B Club and what's going on with them, but more excitingly, and this is where I get super, super excited about the work, the kiddos brought this excitement on the B Club to one of the teachers and they made their passion come to life. So they have bees, they're doing well, everything's really moving forward. At first we were a little detained in collecting the bees. But it's great to see them come with an idea, plan it out, make it happen, and have a positive impact environmentally and beyond. And, and that is true learning, beyond the classroom. And to have the community support that I, that I put in there um, just shows that this is such a great place to live and work and go to school. Our varsity math team is third in the Class A division. Uh, scoring 97 in the last meet, and I made sure to list the kiddos, the nine students that are ranked in the top 100. Super exciting. And this Friday, all of us could use a little hot chocolate. The junior class is doing a fundraiser event this Friday, and the goal is, is that by, selling, by having the free hot chocolate, make a donation if you'd like, they'll raise um, monies to make wellness bags for one of the local organizations that need supports. Similar support, our National Honor Society did the toy drive. Over 300 students' lives were positively, or children's lives in the local community were positively impacted by that work. I know that I think it was the sophomore class donated two bikes because that was on the students' wish list. And you can kind of see it in uh, the picture. Amazing <coughs> photography skills there. <coughs> Working on those. Um, along with the community support, we had Operation Tomahawk. They worked with Reese uh, for America and went around to veterans' graves, supporting community support, honoring those that are veterans, and laid wreaths on their graves over the holidays. It's just fantastic to see our students come and be a part of our community, respecting our community, working with our community, and bringing the needs. For department updates, English, our Algonquin Writing Center, this is really exciting, our kiddos decided to participate in a professional development, similar to our teachers. So we had two teachers go, and our kiddos in the Algonquin Writing Center go, and the goal was to develop their abilities to do peer-to-peer -peer support on improving writing. And so that's where the Writing Center, I've spoken about it before, but then to see them take it to the next level is, is truly phenomenal. So not only are they empowering themselves and their own writing ability, they're empowering all of their peers that go. And it's cross-curricular. It's not just English. It's writing across the curriculum to develop those skills so that they can be successful in college and beyond. We also have Poetry Out Loud. That competition has started, so I snuck those dates in there to kind of get it out there so kiddos are participating in it. Our Bandorama is coming up, and what's exciting about the Bandorama is it's the vertical alignment between fifth grade all the way to 12th grade, and they show you through the different ways that the music is portrayed and played across the concert how students develop through the curriculum and how interwoven it is so that students start to master the different instruments and the different types of genre that they play. Super, super exciting. Um, that's coming up next month. Our library has taken um, a strong initiative to push into classrooms to develop our students' ability to research different databases. Amazing skill to have in college and beyond. And one of the exciting classes that I, that I attended, you know, when I was visiting different classes that were going on that day, was actually this. The students had developed an interest in some of items going on in current events. And the teacher worked with the librarian. They brought the database in. They developed the lesson. Students' questions were answered all through project-based learning. Fantastic, fantastic work. Um, we have a community-based reading program coming up. And I want to do a shout out to Ms. Honey, because she also has a book club run with faculty. I'm in the book club. It's great. It forces you to do a lot of reading. And then you're modeling for the kids the importance of it. And it brings us together to talk about different, different um, events, topics. And it's, it's all faculty. So I'm sitting there talking to every level of faculty members, educators, aides, uh, cafeteria, all of us come together and discuss the common book that we're interested in. And it's also a great way to, to kind of keep the communication lines open, to follow it through. 
our math department. Shout out to our math team, which you heard me say before, but I wanted to give kudos to Melikin, and, I, and hopefully they spoke about this in their school committee principal update. One of Andrew Lee, who's on our math team, recently was on Who Wants to Be a Mathematician Championship. It aired this weekend, so I kind of snuck it in there for anyone who wants to do some YouTube Googling. And last but not least, I thought it was really important to focus on the pride of our alum. So I got to meet the class of 1965 alum, Jim Whitman. He's the engineer at the Equitarium for their train ride. As many of you know, I have two toddlers. And we, we were apparently dressed in all Algonquin gear, so it was pretty obvious uh, what school <laughs> we were for. And he was just <coughs> so excited to say, I'm an Algonquin grad. And he forwarded me this wonderful picture that I had to sneak in there on their 50th reunion and how the class still comes together and talks about the pride that they have in Algonquin and being a part of this regional school. So I wanted to make sure that I ended the principal report with that, that positive push on once a T-Hawk, always a T-Hawk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any <coughs> questions, <coughs> comments, additions? <laughs> Nope. That's, Thank you. That Thank says you. something about the thoroughness of your report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. No questions. My goodness. Thank you very much. We look forward to next month. And it also suggests that maybe we'll move the principal's report after the excitement of talking about budget. <laughs> 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 we can bring that enthusiasm to the uh, preliminary budget this evening. Yes, because the next is enrollments. How exciting. <laughs> They're pretty exciting because okay. all those students that uh, Dr. Walsh talked about are represented here in our enrollment numbers and the current enrollments in your, are in your packet. As you know, um, a couple meetings ago we did uh, distribute that sort of progression of growth of enrollments through the years and this is always, uh, that's always nice to reflect on and, and this is certainly important when it comes to uh, making sure our budget supports all the good work that Sarah uh, spoke about in her report and that all these students will receive as students here at Algonquin. So that's in your packet. Also, I'm going to move right through this. Go ahead. Also in your packet is the um, monthly general fund expenditure report as of December 31st. There are no significant variants. I would request a vote to approve until audited. Congratulations uh, to Matt. I think this is his second. Budget. Second. As second director score. of finance uh, <laughs> report. So many, many, many more to come. And uh, that's here for your vote, Paul. So I move that we accept the audit of the monthly general fund expenditure report as of December 31st, 2017. Second, Bill audited. Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan. Paul Butka, seconded by Dan, till audited. Uh, any questions? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. <laughs> also in your packet is uh, to go along with that uh, expenditure report is a statement of revenue, also dated December 31st. And we have um, of late adopted the practice of voting this as well until audited and I think it's a probably a reasonable practice. Well that is the child practice. I vote that we move to accept the statement of revenue dated December thirty first, twenty seventeen for the North North South Fork Regional School District until it's audited. Second that. Moved by Paul Becker, seconded by Dan. Any questions on that? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Budget priorities are in the packet. We will visit that uh, through the, the uh, preliminary uh, PowerPoint presentation. But I would suggest that um, this is an appropriate time to introduce two letters uh, that I would like the committee to consider. One, uh, I think we talked about two months ago or a month ago, which was uh, sending to our legislative uh, branch the letter in support of the um, Chapter 70 Foundation Review Commission. Uh, changes that move forward. We talked a little bit about it uh, also when we were talking about the MASC convention, that that was certainly a high priority of all the presentations that we uh, participated in and that this review commission has been working tirelessly to um, see those very much needed funding changes occur uh, through the Chapter 70 and the foundation review work that they've uh, put forth. So this letter is here for us to sign this evening. The committee already had done uh, voted to, to uh, sign that letter and send it off. The um, next is a circuit breaker letter that we'd like to send off as well. Uh, this year, the circuit breaker was reduced from 65 to, um, from 75 to 65 percent because we have a practice of sort of banking last year's receipts and using it for next year's expenditures or next year's budgeting practice. Um, the impact has already been 
um, factored into our budget, our preliminary budget. However, uh, we'd like to see that number move up to 75. The original agreement is that it would be 100% funded, mm -hmm. and we haven't seen that yet. So um, this letter is moving through the superintendent's listserv, and uh, again, a request to send off our support in uh, moving that up to 75%. What does that mean for the region? It's about a $59,000 differential when we reduce that by the 10% that they've reduced it by this year. So that's a letter that I would request that the school committee also sign and uh, send off. And that's here for consideration. Also, uh, it's regional transportation. It's a unique discussion. Um, one only that school committee, regional school committees can enjoy. And uh, as we know, that too fluctuates. We're at about 62% reimbursement. That too was supposed to be at 100% someday. I think we might have seen it as high as 78% at one point mm -hmm. a couple of years ago when we did receive that, that sort of parting gift for one of the senators who was uh, very much an advocate for regional transportation. And so um, the good news is that the, um, the state auditor, Suzanne Bump, is definitely behind increasing the fund funding for regional transportation. Uh, she released a fairly lengthy document in a summary review of the impact of reductions in regional transportation to regional school districts. And so um, shared out at a, pre a prior meeting all of the information and the links to that. But I would request that the school committee um, give the okay for me to put a letter together for signature also. Um, the word through, again, the Superintendent's Association is that now is a time to seize the opportunity because right now we're hearing favorable things about the Chapter 70 and about the budget. And how true that is, I'm not sure, but it's an opportunity that if not seized, it will be missed. So I think, you know, moving in that direction is, is, is a wise move forward for the regional district. <coughs> Does anybody have a problem with it? You don't need a vote, just do it. <coughs> you do have the consensus. So there are two uh, draft letters that are already prepared uh, for signatures at the end of this meeting tonight uh, for the committee. And um, our K-8s have also followed suit with respect to the um, circuit breaker request. The calendar is also in your packet, and we have some updates. Um, as we know, we talk about uh, reissuance of our bonds, of our regional school bonds. And uh, there is a very short window of opportunity, according to Bond Council, uh, that we must um, be present as a school committee to participate in that reauthorization process. And because of the window of the date that those bonds will be issued or reissued, and the time and the number of days that are required before uh, that bond issuance closes, we will not be in session. And um, it's that important to be in that window. We do have a Southborough K-8 school committee on March 14th, I believe, uh, the Wednesday, and it fits right into that window. Uh, through a discussion at Regional uh, Operational last week, we discussed trying to piggyback on that date. Uh, it's really a one-item agenda, and it's really to be there for Bond Council to present what he needs to share with us at this time. And um, we'd like to have the meeting held at 5.30. And uh, that will meet the requirements that we need in terms of window of opportunity for that issuance. So I just wanted to share that with you. It's not reflected in the budget calendar. We also know that um, we do have a meeting date scheduled already with the South Pro um, Financial Advisory, which we're very excited about um, attending and presenting our preliminary budget. And that meeting is scheduled for January 31st. I think we're first up. Astabet's thrilled because they are usually in the audience and we take way too much time with our presentation. <laughs> so uh, we'll be looking forward to that. And uh, Northboro Appropriations Committee has not yet identified the date um, that we will be meeting. And uh, tonight's the preliminary. February 28th is an important date. That's uh, the date that we'll be hopefully um, voting the recommended budget it needs to be voted by March 1st so important dates coming our way and coming up rapidly preliminary budget discussion and while I move to the podium um, I also have the updated revised and corrected 
capital for, uh, for distribution as well. And there are some PowerPoints. I'm going to walk this way so the audience actually has a chance to have a copy. Press the power button. You sure? Yeah. Uh, our preliminary numbers and again the no, uh, emphasis on preliminary is very important as we know there's some very critical numbers that play into our ability to move forward with the budgeting process that are not yet known and that's the governor's budget which will be released by January 31st very important for us not only does it share with us the proposed chapter 70 funding but also uh, information on the minimum local contributions that come our way so this evening is um, the collaborative work of a lot of um, members of our administrative team. Uh, Dr. Walsh has been very much involved in the process as the new administrator and principal here at Algonquin, as well as her department chairs and uh, Fran Witten in terms of athletic conversations that we've had, uh, certainly Matt Wells, uh, Greg Martineau, and the entire administrative team. So where we are in the budget process this evening is represented in the presentation. Uh, again, a lot of the work that we do, all of the work that we do, do uh, around budgeting is about providing the best that we can for all of our students and expanding on those opportunities so that they continue, can continue to grow and achieve. We begin with our vision, uh, vision and mission statement, which is embedded in our work. Uh, just a quick snapshot of the budget process. It virtually begins the first day of the new fiscal year. We're expending one bid budget and planning for the next. And uh, here are some critical dates that are very important to the work that we do. That was earlier mentioned this evening when we interviewed um, potential school committee members that we have a number of committees. And we certainly do, um, not only at our K-8s but at our regional level because of the complexity of a regional school district. And uh, here's some of the meetings that we uh, routinely hold to help us with that budget process and ensure that we're on track. Uh, just recently, we had a regional operational budget subcommittee last week, actually, where we began to review some of these preliminary numbers. We also, a very much important part of the process, is to vote our budget priorities early on in the school year so that we can use those priorities to help guide the work that we, that we do each and every day, but certainly to help guide us through the budget process. And then again, our um, capital plan, which is also very important to help um, in the budgeting process. And we move forward to our two town meetings. Uh, this year, Southboro is first, it's April 9th, and town meeting in Northboro is Tuesday, April 23rd. So I mentioned the um, school committee budget priorities. As we go through this, what I'd like to do is sort of do a crosswalk to this year's budget and highlight some of the, um, the components of the um, proposed preliminary budget. Uh, the first is to maintain high quality staff, instruct instructional programming, and instructional resources. We added this about four years ago um, because we did notice that we were uh, needing to refresh and replenish our instructional resources. We're in year four of the five-year plan, and I would suggest that I, I, I think we've done an amazing job fulfilling this particular goal and this budget priority. It's been something that we've looked at each of the four years, and through that, and the work that's been taking place at the high school, the department chairs have um, sort of gone on cycle in terms of which year 
the resources would be replenished. This year, in this budget, we will see that um, there are two particular department areas that have patiently been waiting for their turn in the cycle, and that's the science department, and we're looking at AP Bio? Environmental Science. Environmental Science, a new class that was put into the program some time ago, as well as World History Two, I believe. World History. World His History. And again, social studies, patiently waiting. Uh, they've also been doing a great uh, job introducing digital resources as well into the curriculum. Strive to achieve class size sizes according to school committee policy. Last year, through some outstanding hiring, uh, no, not only in terms of the candidates who we now call teachers, but also um, the impact on the budget. We were able to fulfill the wishes of the school committee, and that was to increase those point eights in world language and in science to to point um, to 1.0s. And we were also able to move forward a 1.0 EL teacher. Uh, wrote his presentation, Webb, the director of um, English language learning in the district, is always um, well received. And uh, it was clear last year from her presentation that if there was any way for that to happen, that was something we needed to have happen. And we were able to do that, as well as um, add the uh, third assistant principal back into the process. And we were able to do all that within the FY18 budget by simply saving in one line and offsetting the, um, the staffing in another. So we were well within our appropriation. This is an interesting third bullet because it becomes even more relevant in our conversation as we move forward this year and into next year. Uh, prepare all students for high levels of success in various high stakes assessments. Earlier this year, we had a review of how well our students continue to do. Um, on those high stake assessments. But this, uh, moving into next year, right, Greg, next year will be the first year the high school will be doing what our K-8s have done the last two years, which is really participate in MCAS 2.0 uh, online. And so that testing environment is moving forward to the high school. The high school is the last in that progression of change um, changing landscape with the state assessment. So the importance of having technology and the infrastructure ready for that to um, be realized here at the high school is in fact reflected in this year's budget, proposed budget for next year. Um, all of that is embedded in our school improvement plan and certainly within our strategic plan and the four focus areas that we um, have embraced over the length of the plan. Meet the goals set forth for our educational technology in the mm -hmm. district technology integration plan. The conversations that we've had about needing mobile devices for the implementation of MCAS 2.0 at the high school is definitely embedded in that implementation plan, that tech implementation plan, as well as our desire throughout the districts to move to a one-to-one -one mobile device environment. While we've continually funded the high school's technology line item, uh, this year, you'll see in the budget proposal that we're proposing to do more, simply because it's time to really embrace the notion of moving to uh, bring your own device here at the high school. The students regularly use their own device, and we need to make sure that we're prepared with the infrastructure to support that as we move forward in that direction. And to create and fund a short and long-term capital plan for the high school, and we've done that, and it was redistributed again this evening. Uh, we met with Mike Gorman this morning, Director of Facilities, mm -hmm. and we started to talk about what are we doing with the FY18, and uh, what does that look like for FY19. This is a maintenance budget this year. Um, you'll note that as we go through the budget, uh, there are significant or several impacts that we are considering as we put forth the preliminary numbers. But I want to also um, point out very specifically that a maintenance budget does not mean stagnation. It, in fact, does not. We are able to embrace the additional uh, instructional resources within the constraints of the budget that we've, we've uh, presented this evening because we've been planful and mindful that this is the fourth year of a five-year plan. So we've done long-range planning within the budget, and we're also seizing some opportunities that are uh, that will sunset next year, and we'll talk about that in terms of technology. A significant um, impact in this year's budget, as it is each and every year, are um, our contractual obligations. The COLA, the, we know the uh, contracts were settled last year, uh, all three, happily so, and um, we continue to see that impact the budget. 
Operational fixed costs. This is the most significant impact in our budget this year. We've talked about rising health care costs, and unlike a K-8 budget where the teacher's insurance is paid through the town, because we are considered by state, mandate, by state law a regional district, which is considered a town within our budget, we carry all those expenses that would be otherwise carried at the K-8 level. So health care costs, insurance costs, Medicare, and all of those um, kinds of operational employee benefit expenses. The only way health care, the direction that health care is going is up, and we dealt with this last year. You might uh, recall that all of the contracts were settled, and we needed to open them up again to talk with our associations about insurance concessions. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we've been extremely proactive this year. Uh, we are collaborating with um, our communities as always and uh, have spoken with both Southboro and Northboro about the opportunity to consolidate. And uh, we've gone in December out for an RFP. We had all pretty much um, seven of the major 12 health insurance carriers submit proposals. We've had preliminary conversations with our associations about uh, changes that will take place and opportunities for good changes. And what this means for us is a significant impact um, for our budget. The association uh, and we will be meeting on Monday to have uh, more general conversations with its membership. And I am hopeful that we will reach a um, decision on where we're headed <coughs> with the information that we've been able to gather and uh, the cost benefits that we've been able to realize through this RFP process prior to February vacation so that we are well positioned to finalize a recommended budget. Uh, it's critical that these conversations take place in terms of our budget uh, planning process. Technology infrastructure upgrades and mobile device, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, that will be a cost impact for this year's budget, renewal of instructional resources, and shifting staff from grant funded to operational budget. Uh, this isn't something we can do overnight. We have about, and I say about because it changes every summer, uh, it's tough to plan for it because the state and the federal government lets us know in July and August what it is that we're going to receive. And as we talked about last month, this is not funding innovative new opportunities, but rather sustaining positions that are vital to the general operations of our school. It's Title I money, it's Title III that supports EL, it's Title II that supports professional development, and that's roughly the amount that we receive um, and what comes our way from the federal government or the state government. We did, however, three years ago receive a Metro West grant, and it allowed us to start an access program at the high school, which was a program that met the needs of those students who, for short or long-term term reasons, were hospitalized and needed to get reacclimated to the school. The grant was in, in excess of $250,000, but as all good grants go, they have a sunset provision. And the notion is they sunset over time because it allows the district or the recipient of the funds to move those costs if it's a successful program onto operational budget. We can't absorb that in one budget season. So what we've done in this budget um, is to move about $40,000 onto operational. It saves a very critical piece of um, a nurse, the, the nursing grant, which is about $27,000 to our high school, is ending. Uh, we have uh, this last year to enjoy it, and we know that the Metro West Health Grant will uh, sunset next year. So we've got to be mindful of that now, and just like our instructional resources, be planful of as to how we're going to absorb that, not in one year, but over time. <coughs> Excess and deficiency, uh, as soon as the preliminary presentation um, ends tonight, we're going to have a, a little conversation about maybe establishing some language around um, ex excess and deficiency. 
as we know through the budgets process, we've been able to return um, some of our E&D money each and every year to our towns to give them some fiscal relief as they prepare um, for their budgets and we move closer to town meeting. We are, as a school district, a regional school district, allowed to um, retain, sort of like a town's free cash, 5% of our unencumbered end of the year funds. Our budgets are about 23 million. It will continue to grow, so that 5% will continue to increase with the budgets. But assuming it's a 5% that we're allowed to maintain by Mass General Law, it would be about a million 150,000. If uh, we were to look at a range, a policy range of 3.25 at the lowest end, it would be 747,500. So where are we right now? And this is important because it's part of our preliminary budget conversation. So where are we right now? Right now we have a balance, non-certified FY17 E&D balance of approximately, and I say approximately because it's not certified yet, $614,829. That would mean that we would need 132,671 unencumbered funds at the end of this year to reach our, let's say, a proposed target of 3.25% or 7475 Of that amount, we have been allocating uh, e and D funds to offset the assessments to our two towns. And last year we returned 500,000 uh, appropriated or expended, if you will, or returned based on our regional agreement, which is population as of October 1. And so uh, that's going to be an important part of our conversation as we learn more about the Chapter 70 numbers and the minimum local contribution amounts something to consider and um, there's a policy, some policy language for us to consider as well. Um, if we were to return 300,000, we would be at 314 and 132, well below 600 in our E&D account as we move in to next year. There is some great news. We talked a little bit earlier about the reissuance of the bonds, 10 years on our 20 year life of this building. Exciting that it's uh, 10 years, we're, we're at the halfway point. Uh, this is an opportunity that hasn't presented itself to us before and um, we're going to seize that and what we will realize or what our towns will realize is over the next 10 years, there's an anticipated um, assessment relief of, of $100,000. So that $100,000 would be allocated by the regional school agreement um, based on enrollment as of October 1. So um, I would suggest that through the good work of the bond um, and considering the reissuance of the bonds, we're in fact already returning $100,000 just because of the work that we've done. Where are we this year with the budget? Our FY 2018 appropriated budget was $22,304,466. I use this as a preliminary target range. Uh, we do work with uh, both North Bro and South Bro very closely. And the range, and it is a range, is uh, three to three and a half percent on operational budget, which is about an increase of 699,134 on the conservative side and 780,656 dollars on the highest side. Right now, today, with our preliminary budgets, maintenance budgets, budgets only with increases in those identified areas. We are at uh, $23,495,183, which is a 5.34% preliminary incremental increase over last year, or just about $1.2 million. How does that break out? Um, Paul, those, those spikes are for you. Um, I know that this is, Dan has his enrollment chart that he likes, so we try to make sure we uh, address everyone's exciting parts of the budget. And so um, how does that break out? And when we do say maintenance, it is in fact that. When you look at what is really discretionary, in other words, things that we have that we could maybe adjust, we're looking at about 9% total of the overall increase. 
Where is our most significant increase realized through this budget? That one million two. It's contractual obli hello. Mm -hmm. um, contractual obligations of seven hundred and eighteen thousand five hundred and fifty eight. Mm -hmm. That is total contractual obligations. That represents those shifts in employment um, positions that I mentioned earlier. That represents that shift of forty thousand dollars onto operational budget. These people are all under contract. And it also encompasses the COLA increase and the, um, the increase in steps and lanes for all employees. We have an 11 percent, again, meeting all students' needs, um, tuition uh, impact uh, with our collaborative placement and with our out-of-district placements. I would say the high school does an amazing job mm -hmm. with all their innovative programs of keeping our students where they need to be and where we hope they remain, and that's in our district, uh, working closely at home and working with our staff here. So the number of programs that we have at the high school to meet a very broad-based range of student needs is phenomenal and uh, very committed staff. I had an opportunity to attend their PD yesterday, and they were focused on yet more ways to mentor and to make connections with students. It was an all-day event. It was phenomenal. So it was, it was a very exciting, um, exciting morning because we're never satisfied. We're always looking for ways to continue to prove, improve. We have a 5% um, five, uh, five technology increase, and uh, Greg and I rehearsed this, and I finally said, you know what? You're going to explain this. So um, there's something called E-rate. And next year is the last year that we can take advantage of E-rate, which is sort of a, if you buy this, then you get some extra uh, resources to buy more. The money needs to be sent on, spent on infrastructure upgrades. We're very fortunate because that's one of our target areas so that we can move forward with our <coughs> new own device. Doing so and doing it well will mean savings on the budget down the road because we're not necessarily purchasing as many devices. So um, we have, all, uh, over the last several years, that maintenance notion, funded our uh, tech line item at uh, $110,200. And this year, we're adding another 55000 to that. And Greg, the reason we're adding another 55000 is because if we, we spend if we spend, if we have $100,000, we have $100,000 worth of projects um, that are reflected in this budget. With um, E-rate money, we get reimbursed 40%, and our appropriated budget, we would get 60, we would pay 60%. So for every dollar we spend, um, we get 40%, 40 cents back on the dollar. So the true cost in the budget is about $60,000 to the district and we'll get 40% reimbursement. Um, so it's an opportunity to capitalize on this, um, this amount of money, and it is the last year that we can do that. And it's an opportunity, that, that's it. It sunsets just like a grant. And the timing is, is um, fortuitous for us because it's exactly what we need to be doing uh, to advance our um, Bring Your Own Device initiative. So that is uh, an investment in the savings, while necess not necessarily um, appearing that way as an increase in the budget. We have, a, by contract, a 1% uh, transportation increase on our contract with our bus company. Again, um, we're hoping that regional transportation increases so that we can get some relief in that area of um, expenditure. Um, I put the 2% administration here because uh, we had a lot of conversations about the fact that we added an assistant principal, and it's important to note that we were able to realize that in the FY18 budget. So we're not really increasing that in the budget because it was offset in other line items. So um, athletics, uh, Fran did um, put forth an athletic budget. It's been some time since we actually increased the operational budget, and the 2% increase in the operational budget really just covers the increased cost in the AD, in the um, transportation uh, to games and so forth, and then our coaches and folks who are under contract. There's the health insurance right there, 
We are hopeful that if the proposal that we have on the table moves forward, that while it's a 16% increase on budget, we're going to realize a greater savings than 16%. So we're looking forward to our conversations next week. And then there's that 3% instructional resources where we're looking at um, increasing science, 13.5 uh, and um, history 15,000, which is a little less than what she had hoped, but um, still an increase. So why are those pulled out of the circle? I don't, Mr. Butka. <laughs> I don't like because those are the only ones that we have any real discretion in our, in our spending. All those others, the other 90% of the $1.1 million proposed increase is mandatory spending that we can only change by you know, laying off employees, but if we if we are preparing a maintenance budget where just kind of everything stays in place as it is, all of those contractual increases come our way and we have no no real choice there. There's no there's no negotiations, there's no there's no anything. So we can we can decide to spend a little more or a little less on a book or two, on some PCs or two, uh, but 90% of that $1.19 million budget is locked in, assuming we maintain equal staff. And that's why we're very hopeful that the conversations with our associations are going so well right now. And I think, um, you know, I want to do, I want to uh, share a positive comment about the work that we're doing around health insurance. This is the second year. Uh, we'll be having the same conversations to some extent next year as we move forward. But uh, I think they're very cognizant of the fact that the regional budget is a different type of budget. That those expenses that are housed in our budget um, play an important part in terms of what we can continue to support with staffing and what we can continue to support with all those other resources that we talked about this evening. And so um, the spirit of collaboration and continued dialogue is uh, is very high because there we've spent we've had lots of classes about the regional school budget and I think uh, we no longer have to talk when we get together about why this is so important to everyone here so I'm I'm uh, optimistic we're always looking for ways to provide some support and that can be in the form of revenue it can be in the form of just collaborating with other districts, and maximizing our opportunities to decrease our costs. So I thought I'd share a few of those with you tonight. So um, it's important to know that we're not always asking for additional funding. We're actually very proactive trying to find ways to offset those costs. So here are some of those. Uh, a couple years ago, we um, established a relationship with Cambridge um, Institute and uh, we welcomed some uh, exchange students from China. And this year, uh, with good work of Lisa Conry, uh, we have um, entered into a relationship with CIEE. Sarah, we talked about this today. C stands for connections. Oh, you found it? No, I just found it. <laughs> um, I, we've got the IEE, International oh, Education yeah. Exchange. So. Um, so uh, what that means is when a student comes to visit us and spends a year with us, uh, it's exciting for our students to have someone um, share their experiences, but uh, we're, we actually realize uh, a tuition. So it's much like school choice, except the students are coming here for a year, and we're able to charge uh, uh, the actual per pupil expenditure, which is about 16,000. We agreed when we launched this that we would bank those funds until such time as we could afford perhaps to expand the world language program and pay for a staff member for three years while we slowly added that into the budget. That was the original plan. Uh, and right now we do have um, at least <coughs> one year's worth of that, maybe a, a year and a, three months of another. Um, our teachers, beyond doing a, an amazing job in the classroom, are always looking for ways to receive grant funding, not only through the Northbridge Ed Foundation, but the Southboro Ed Foundation as well, and many private grants. 
The good news about a grant is it oftentimes gives you that sort of venture capital, that seed money to start something new. But we're ever mindful that uh, nothing is free and just like the Metro West grant, we're always looking for um, it to be a successful endeavor and how are we going to sustain that in our budgets. Um, lots of donations and contributions from members of the community, private donations, certainly the booster organization. and. Um, we do have a fee structure at the school. We participate in collaborative purchasing with any um, viable group, and that includes schools. I talk often about the Assabet Valley Collaborative. Because we're a member of that collaborative, we realize um, very favorable purchasing rates, and so we collaborate with them on all kinds of things, including special ed transportation. And because we work together, we're able to keep our costs down. And yes, the sun will shine, and um, we are still uh, entering and pursuing phase two of our solar feasibility study with the promise of savings to come. We, it has been quite some time since we have <coughs> increased our facilities usage fees, years. And uh, we realize that we might be um, incredibly competitive uh, as we rent out this magnificent facility. And so um, we are, with the good work of Matt, launching an analysis of our fees to make sure that um, while we want people to come in, we want to make sure we're charging a competitive rate for the use of this facility. Because that also then does cover some of our custodial costs as well. And we want that to be realized through the revolving account, not operational budget. Uh, while not popular, it is true that we also have not revisited our um, school lunch costs for some time. And whether we, we do anything, raise, lower, stay the same, it's something that we should be doing on a cyclical basis. And we plan to have these done by um, June so that we'll be able to um, share that with school committee in terms of where we are with all of that. Circuit breaker, we talked a little bit about that earlier today. We are one fortunate district. Others are not so fortunate that we have the ability to bank the receipts that we receive in any given year to offset next year's expenditures. Um, there are times when the expenditures are so high that we might, and unanticipated, that we have to d dip into the current year's receipts. Um, we are not in that position moving forward um, in 2019. So we know that we have $3,802 and $379 to bank towards our special ed uh, costs next year. And that's the 65% number that we spoke about a little earlier. Here are some other things that we're doing. Um, we're continuing to use our facilities rental. We just talked about that in the last slide to offset either one-time upgrades or one-time expenditures like our security system. The transportation reimbursement, we're being very proactive <coughs> and we're hoping that 62 moves up. Any 1% is, is um, money celebrated. Our grants and our revenues is always a moving target. They haven't been going any way but down, inverse relationship to health care costs. And our athletic total budget submitted by our AD for next year is 901,670. And so in our preliminary budget, I mentioned it increased slightly to cover those contractual costs, we have uh, a number, a budget number of 536747 which, if we want to fulfill the request of the budget, leaves gate receipts and fees and perhaps donations from many organizations, one of which would be the boosters, of $364,923. Um, but the impact on operational right now is the 536 figure. The uh, E-rate that uh, Greg mentioned earlier, basically it's 40 cents on a dollar if spent for infrastructure, so there's some reimbursement funds right there. Here's the historical enrollment percentages. It's just interesting um, to look at each and every year, and you'll notice that uh, enrollment from uh, North Grove up, South Grove slightly down. Recommended regional budget. This is based on 
what we know from last year's budgeting process. This has been updated to include the revised assessments that we voted in October. Oftentimes that happens. Our budget is approved and then they, deci they decide on a budget well after our budget has been voted and approved. So I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, the math, but basically our preliminary budget, 23,495,183. What are our offsets that we receive from the state and or some other federal um, entity? Chapter 70 last year was 3,078,274. We do not know the number for this year, but it plays a significant impact. We know regional transportation is 674,995. We have 20,000 um, of miscellaneous income and or interest. All of that added up is subtracted from the preliminary budget. So our uh, budget moving forward with the offset, 19,721,914, apportioned by minimum local contribution, which we have nothing to do with. That number comes to us from the state, and there have been fluctuations in that number over the last several years. So we're awaiting that information as well. It's important to our towns, our member towns, because ultimately it processes through to um, the budget impact for them. After required contributions and that calculation, there's a $7 million uh, remaining um, budget number. And so that moves forward. And we calculate it based on enrollment, and that's part of the regional agreement. And so as we move through the numbers using FY18 numbers at this point, um, assuming a $300,000 for discussion, um, excess and deficiency offset with that additional $100,000 uh, $100, assessment that will be coming to our towns through the bond issuance, $400,000. Um, the preliminary FY 2019 assessment, 11,365,855 to Northboro, 7,956,059 to Southboro. That represents an 8.44% increase on operational budget, um, on assessment to Northboro of 8.44 and 6.74 to Southboro. And where does that fall in terms of the range, the historical range of uh, budget increase, a proposed 5.34 enrollments of 1474 Northboro assessment number of 8.44, Southboro's assessment number of 6.74 on the preliminary budget projection, projections. What do we not know? Very important information. We do not know the governor's budget, and we're anxious for that to be released. We are not sure yet what the transportation aid reimbursement will be. We are hopeful that circuit breaker reimbursement moves up, and we are hopeful that the, I'm calling it the health care reform here in our conversations with our association goes down. And so all of that will be coming our way within the next couple weeks. And that will drive our discussions forward as we move closer to that recommended budget date on February 28th. Not quite as exciting as Sarah's presentation about our students, <laughs> because we always want to talk about our students. And these numbers support their work. Thank you. <clears throat> comes up of uh, fees. So we talk about um, the potential budget offsets, and you list uh, correctly grants, donations, contributions, and fees. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, when I see that there is um, some benefit coming with the bond reissuance and, and you know, paying off the bond for the school, and, and I know that that's money going back, or less money that is being asked of from the town, so in effect, parents are getting some relief. Um, I don't know that they see it as much as they would see it in actual dollar relief for them in not having, and I, and I remain hopeful that there has got to be a time uh, and maybe I'm naive in this hope that, uh, you know, the fees that were instituted at one point, um, you know, for decades, there were no fees for students like that, for it to be on an athletic team or to be in a band or to just be a student. I think there's actual, you know, just student fees, um, you know, parking fees, and, and that's real money coming out of parents. It will, do you ever foresee a time when uh, fees could be decreased? especially when we're starting to see some relief on the bond. And then in, an idea with, for that might be um, to still uh, ask for a fee, but it could be a voluntary fee. If your student is play, playing in something and, and you know, the voluntary contribution is X, and I bet you you're going to get a lot of parents who are still going to pay it, but you know, there could be some real relief for the parents who still pay it and don't want to ask for, um, you know, dispensation from that fee. They would may feel bad about asking to not have to pay it, but it sure would be a nice opportunity to voluntarily not pay it. So I think what's exciting is the conversation that was part of the budget presentation about analyzing what it is we have, what, what do we do with that, and where, where are we with some of those costs. Um, we talked about fees that was on the list, as well as, you know, our lunch and our rental fees and so forth. So I think the thing that we are is always mindful, uh, whether it's looking for opportunities through solar or um, grants to look at ways at reducing costs, uh, not only to our towns, but also to for our parents. Um, it's a very rare event where there is a high school in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a public high school that does not have a fee structure. So probably a realistic discussion is how much can we reduce those fees and how much more is manageable, much like we do with grants, translating that or trans transitioning it to operational budget. So I think this is a great opportunity to have those conversations. We haven't reviewed our fee structure or um, you know, the expenses charged to those fees in a while. So I think it's a good opportunity. And, and you know, and I, that's very much appreciated because I think even having some nominal decrease, you know, if we're seeing some reduction because of the bond, you know, if there is even a nominal increase to recognize the fact that, you know, we maybe fees are always going to have to be required. Maybe it's part of what the Commonwealth just does now, and, and we're part of that. We, you know, we, yeah, I... I'd be one to see if we could set ourselves apart from that and maybe not have to do fees again. Um, but is there even an opportunity to reduce a small amount? Or as I said, even offering it in a, as a voluntary basis and, and um, it's a little harder to forecast then what might actually come in from that. So that could be a challenge. But I, it's my, one of my favorite topics. I see it and I, I, I would just, I think there's an opportunity here to maybe do something for parents mm -hmm. um, who every year, uh, and, and I know it as a parent, you get, whoops, what's due again? You know, what fee is that for? And all right, another check. And you know, so anyway. We did make a favorable move a couple of years ago when we were analyzing our fee structure. It's probably about four years ago, maybe five years ago, where we did um, present a more favorable fee structure for multi-year athletes mm -hmm. and for parents who had multiple, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. multiple children in the high school. Mm -hmm. So there is a history that there's mm -hmm. a, a step in the right direction, and you know maybe it's time to explore an another step in that way. And I'll, my, one final comment: I do think <laughs> you're exactly right that if we're we need to charge competitive rates for the use of our facilities, and if. And if that brings in some additional revenue, could we help offset what's being assessed to our own parents for our own kids to use our own fields when they're playing, for instance, sports? Until next year. So, I mean, so we do make some money on renting out the facility, but it, it's it's pretty small. I don't I don't know that 
increasing the rates in, in some sort of, uh, I mean, even a 10 or 15 or 20 percent price hike, I don't know that it would make a material difference in a way that we could we could dramatically attack uh, fees this year. I think solar, mm -hmm. solar is the solar is the the golden ring that you know if if that happens as as well as we hope, there's a chance. But in a year when we're hitting Southboro with a 6.7 percent increase and Northboro with an 8.4 percent increase on their assessments at this point in time, it's kind of hard to cut some fees out and make those numbers go even higher. It just it seemed it seemed tough, um, you know. And and this is still all with all of those other things that we do in terms of chasing grants and you know we say it's a 20. 20, what, 23 and a half million dollar budget. But a lot of that, so all those things, the, the grants, the student athletic receipts and all that, that's all taken out of that number beforehand. I mean, it's really a 20, 20 what, 26, 27 million dollar budget. But because of all the work that they do to either, either in, in fees or grants or chasing the Council on International Educational Exchange to Pick up money for you know three or four foreign exchange students. It's, uh, I mean, it's uh, they work really hard to try and get that down, but it's it's tough because then the, the insurance companies turn around and they whack you, and then the state turns around and they t say that you've got to they have all these mandatory programs that they say they're going to reimburse you for, and then they don't. But it's still mandatory, and you still have to deliver on them. And it's it's just a it's such an uphill battle. And, and you know we we go through it annually. It's 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 you know it's hard, it's hard to figure out which pocket to take the money out of. But you know if we're going to continue to deliver the quality education that we have here, I, I think we're we're a little bit stuck until. I mean, I, and I'm holding out all sorts of hope for this solar thing making a making a big, big difference. And, um, and that would be the year that we should really take a good hard look. The, the bond was a terrific thing, you know. But frankly, but it's still only a hundred grand. You know, it's fifty grand of forty grand to one town, sixty to another. It's I mean, it's nice, but it's a twenty-seven million dollar budget. It's it's you know, it's it's a rounding issue with with a hundred grand. So it's 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 a it's tough. I don't know if this is the year for us to attack fees, but we should maybe put it on the agenda for next year to really take a good hard look. We'll be that much closer to solar, maybe as a as a, <laughs> as an answer. The two could dovetail well. Budget priority discussion, mm -hmm. but um, we also um, referenced E and D in the presentation and the impact of E and D not only uh, for the regional school system but also for our uh, two communities. And in the process, we learned um, that um, if we have an E and D policy and um, if we take certain steps, our regional school district is looked upon very favorably from bond council because they know that we're cognizant of what expenses we have, what um, capabilities we have to have financial reserves. And so the mere fact that we would have some of these things in place would bode well for us when we are moving forward and considering bond ratings and so forth. I think one of the most exciting presentations um, at MASC was um, the Moody presentation just about how they look at school systems, in particular regional school districts, and the kinds of things that we could do to make ourselves more favorable. Um, and maybe it doesn't, you know, mean today, but doing the things that we need to do today will, um, you know, reap benefits in return down the road when we're trying to position ourselves. We don't know what's going to happen with the conversation about the, you know, the um, enhancements to our facility com our, um, fields com our athletic complex but there may be a time where we have to you know to go to bond council and we want the best rating that we could possibly get because that means it's the most favorable rate mm -hmm. so doing some of these things now is um, you know sort of being forward thinking in with that in mind the regional um, operational subcommittee last week reviewed some general policy language and we thought that we would bring this to the committee tonight it's appropriate it falls under the budget uh, discussion because we were talking about excess and deficiency. So this is the language and um, there's, it's really I guess for tonight discussion no action required um, and probably this will go back to um, the policy subcommittee on the regional operational I guess. 
what we're saying here in, in, in the policy, that by, by law, if you have leftover money that's excess and deficient, in excess of 5%, you have to give that delta back. Just right away, you have to give it back. Um, we've kind of taken a position over the years that, you know, we've actually gone lower than that 5% and given more money back to the towns in order to offset the assessments a little bit. I mean, finally, we took the advice of, of the, the council that we had that, we should have a policy about that. And so what we're, what we're trying to write up here is to say, you know, to have a rainy day fund, have an E&D fund, makes all the sense in the world. And for a complex as big as this, you know, we should have it. And it should have some materiality to it. We don't think it needs to be 5%. And so what we've said is we'll develop a policy that says we're going to try and keep that number between 3 and a quarter and 3.75. To the extent that we're higher than that, we'll bring our number down to 375, throw the rest of it back into the towns to offset the assessments. If for some reason we're way below that, way below the minimum, the minimum three and a quarter, we'll actually look at maybe putting some extra money in our budget so that we can bring our rainy day fund up to the three and a quarter. It's all discretionary. It, it's all, it, we give the power to ourselves on an annual basis to vote to either enforce the policy or modify the policy, but just having it makes the bond, the bond council people look at us more favorably, and if that's the case, well, we can certainly write something down that, that doesn't really tie our hands very much, but does give us strong kind of guidelines that show what we're trying to do, make some sense, I think, to them, and, and you know, they're, they're kind of, they seem like reasonably good numbers to us, but certainly to the wisdom of the committee to vote them or, vote them or not. Um, yeah, so <coughs> we, we <clears throat> talked about this, um, the range of the 3.25 to 3.75, and I think that um, Christine had come up with that recommendation, correct? Actually, that, the recommendation from Mars is 4%. Mars <coughs> is the you know, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools, and um, they, this was a, a couple of years ago, and I just found my, my edits from it. It was about 4%. So we're actually lower than what the regional school association suggests. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bond Council, um, and through the presentation this summer, this was the range. Our new uh, district treasurer, Christine Tagg, has experience uh, at Dover Sherbin. They have a similar uh, policy um, as, uh, as do many regional schools. And so this was sort of a realistic range without being. So this is more like a um, conservative, more of a range that people are actually, districts are actually able to accomplish and, and still be able to keep their assessments to their towns, mm -hmm. the member towns, um, and help them out by returning, but yet leaving, leaving the district with some money um, so that, uh, you know, one thing, <clears throat> So, so that if something comes up at one time, a need, they, you know, have the money available. Um, you know, other things that sometimes that we can, because we've uh, offset our assessment for, which is an operational um, expenses, but, you know, we could also have other uses of the E&D as well in air market for like one time, you know, we get one time. Um, savings that we can take that one-time savings instead of uh, subsidizing an operational budget, which would then you'd have the problem. You just have the problem next year. You know, we can we can do things with our E and D. That's um, as we get, as we refine how we're using it. We can start maybe implementing some of those kinds of things and use it. You know, more more for one-time things instead of 100% always using it to subsidize the operation of the budget. Um, but, but I think, you know, to have a range, to set up a range where we never had anything like that before, and it was always, in, like in my mind, I always would always ask, you know, Cheryl, how much does that leave us, you know, in kind of a uh, back of the envelope kind of thing. Okay, I kind of feel comfortable with that, but you know, to have a range that we try to stick to and that we know that that's what it is and that's a good sound financial policy um, rather than, you know, just kind of in my head, okay, that sounds like enough. Um, I think it, 
you know, it's something that we should um, pursue. Paul? I don't want to steer the discussion too far away from the E&D. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. But uh, I want to go back to the, uh, the uh, <coughs> fee discussion. I, I, too, it's long bugged me that we have to charge fees for all these things. And But I agree with Paul. This is probably not the year to address it. But to me, it goes back to a state responsibility. And I'm, I'm kind of guessing here. But I think all these fees came into place over the past decades as money from the state decreased. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much we stand to gain if, you know, this Chapter 70 thing goes through and they, they actually take all the recommendations of that Chapter 70 review committee. I guess is it's not a ton for us, but um, but other things like the transportation and the uh, circuit breaker, I mean, that's that's significant dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think, you know, we need to be pushing back on the state. And uh, we're going to do that. We, um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned this at the last meeting. We, I, I reached out to Carolyn Dykeman and we had this discussion at the mm -hmm. South Florida Pool Committee last week, and she's going to uh, set up a meeting with, I think, <clears throat> the three committees, as well as um, all the representatives, the state senators that represent all the towns that she represents, as well as Northboro. So, yeah. And I think Paul raises a great point. So when when you mentioned that um, uh, our uh, previous years we've been receiving seventy five percent of what we should have been receiving, and this year is maybe going to be sixty five. So we're going to issue a notice a letter saying we're expecting and looking for 75 I believe you mentioned that it's supposed to be a hundred um, what is that um, what what does that mean it's supposed what is was there an agreement in principle was it a you know is there actually something in writing that says it's supposed to be a hundred percent and should we be saying not 75 we expect a hundred percent at a minimum, we'll be happy to receive 75 this year, with the expectation that that you know, the, you know that delta you'll make up for in the following year when you give us 125 percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, it is a law, right? The law, the law, the law, the law yeah. said when they passed it that they were going to reimburse. Yeah, there's passing and laws. Every and year, they just you know they, they write a check that's not equal to the spend. And so they also have raised sort of the, the foundation number that you um, need to calculate that 65%. So it is a misconception that the reimbursement is dollar one. The, the reimbursement <coughs> kicks in after you've already expended, uh, I think it's $42,000 uh, per event. <clears throat> so um, it's 65% above the $42,000 foundation expenditure made by the district. It's the delta. And that's what the 65% is calculated on. The other piece of the circuit breaker that's very problematic is um, a very significant cost uh, with um, special education and placements, particularly out of district placements, is transportation. And transportation does not apply for a circuit breaker, uh, is not included in what's eligible to receive reimbursement. So, um, you know, if we spend $2 million on transportation, even if the foundation amount was spend a million, 65% on a million dollars is a lot of reimbursement, and transportation is not covered. The other pushback uh, from cities and towns and many school districts has, has been uh, over the years what is considered reimbursable costs for services. Mm -hmm. So many of the services that we provide are medical types of um, supports for students that arguably may qualify for health care. Well, if it qualifies for health care, then we're probably looking at health care increases, but maybe indirectly. So um, why not include more of that? So it isn't just, you know, the 65 percent. It's what are you getting the 65 percent on? And so arguably, uh, we've always talked about including transportation in that calculation and also these other student services as well, um, because that alone would would result in significant reimbursable dollars to the district because our transportation is is quite high. So um, even just including those. So it's the percent, it's what the percent is calculated on, and it's, you know, don't increase the 42,000. Um, I remember when I was finance director years ago, the, the cap was, I think, 27,000, and that was not that long ago. So that's crept up uh, over time as well. So it's, it's all of that. 
Uh, it's not just, you know, the percent, which arguably we would love to see 100 percent. We'd love to see 100 percent on everything that I just mentioned. Um, so the good news is, or not so good news, is that um, the um, quarter nine chamber also has the breakfast with our legislators, and that's coming up as well, and they're all there. And I know Southboro oftentimes has uh, presentations at the library where you invite in uh, legislative um, members of the legislative branch, and Northboro always has uh, once a year uh, that same event, and they know it's circuit breaker. It's we've been bringing it forward, you know, every year in all of these events, and um, and yet, and yet, here we are talking about it again. <clears throat> but we, you know, we can't give up the fight, and um, you know, it, it's fun to watch the buzz that goes back and forth. Uh, with different superintendents because we think we're unique and then we realize that everybody else is having the same conversation because it's important and right now there's this tremendous um, sense of urgency because uh, we they feel there's a different there's additional revenues to be had and so there's a push right now for yeah let's fund what you said you were going to fund by law Regional transportation is the same. It wasn't supposed to be 62%. It was always supposed to be the agreement that if you regionalized, this is what you would, how you would benefit. And that's how that, you know, all came about. Um, if you regionalized, arguably, your distances and your bus transportation is significantly more complicated than a single, uh, you know, K-12 system. And so the reimbursement was supposed to offset the fact that you took that leap and you know, establish a partnership with another community, and it's never—they've never fulfilled that obligation either. Um, so there's language out there to be had. I think, I think that fees would be something to take up next year. The other thing too that, you know, we don't charge for buses, and other towns charge for busing, and it may not be to the families, but it, like trash, like there's different ways yeah, right. that they actually get the people that their residences in town. To pay for stuff like that, so we're fortunate. I mean, I know we're yeah. getting into taxes and stuff like that. But. It's a law, I think. On, on if you regionalize, you can't yeah, charge for right. busing. Is that a 100 percent law, or is that a 75 percent? We can comply. 62 percent law. It's not a very good law. I don't know what percentage yeah, that is. You can't but charge because we're getting reimbursed. Interestingly <laughs> enough, as part of our uh, <laughs> interesting uh, dialogue with. Um, I just blanked out on his name. Jay Sullivan, guru from the Department of Education. Yep. All that's budget is Jay. <clears throat> so we had a presentation. Uh, we, in, we asked Jay to come to the Regional School Association to talk to us about what is uh, fake information and what is true about reimbursement because of our ongoing conversation around start time because we wanted to be accurate in terms of what we could um, you know, where we might realize some cost savings. And you can charge, but they reduce your reimbursement. So it's a net effect. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that new piece of information, but it really didn't help us. So um, in effect, you can't because you're getting a reimbursement. Um, and they would just take it from the reimbursement. We found out some other great things about um, ridership and those kinds of things. but. We didn't find any more money than what they were already giving. But we keep looking. And there appear to be things that are still up in the air. So hopefully they will fall in our favor. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Did, uh, did you want to continue on a capital plan or? Uh, that was for distribution, that was distribution. only. Okay. Um, I, I did say I would make those corrections and bring them back. And, uh, you know, we continue to have conversations around those and <coughs> meet what's listed on that. Okay. Fair enough. All right. There is no old business, so on to policy development, more policy development and or distribution. So first read is E110, Policy and Procedures for Use and Rental of School Facilities. This is actually exciting. Very. Um, so not that all of what we have been talking about is not, but uh, I think we've made some quick improvements to this policy. Uh, we had a great policy meeting uh, last week. It was, yes, last week. And we um, came to the 
revelation that perhaps one of the reasons that we haven't been reviewing our facilities um, fees and our rental structure on an ongoing <coughs> basis is because it's tied to policy and in reality the procedural piece of every policy is not attached to the policy so when we look to examine our fees on a regular basis because it is attached to policy it goes back to policy subcommittee mm -hmm. so what we'd like to do is sort of decouple this and create just a generic policy and then have that um, actual practical cost piece something we review every year and so that's what you see in front of you as a result of some great work by subcommittee so we're just taking the first so the rest is crossed off yeah we'll just read the first part so the rest will be something that we take up as a normal financial business practice every year a review and hopefully we'll be coming back to committee with those updates every year it's all a first reading again Second reading. Second reading. F one hundred, I four hundred, There were some suggestions for edits. I can just read them uh, quickly. Um, that's okay. Sure. F one hundred. Just uh, this was uh, from Mr. Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Desmond. Uh, on the naming committee policy, F100, second paragraph under process. Uh, what it says now in terms of the naming subcommittee shall be 18 months and they meet once every five years. Uh, we'd like to suggest that we just sort of restructure um, that sentence so that it reads, every five years a naming subcommittee will be formed and its term will last 18 months. Uh, there's also a link that we're going to add to the end of this which has the listing of what is now currently named and um, that link is not <coughs> yet live which is why it's absent but it definitely will be attached to this document um, did we also talk about that being <clears throat> every five years upon the completion I don't see that I thought we talked about that making it be five years after the 18 months so that it's not like Every three and a half years. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in the policy. We'll meet once every five years to evaluate names upon completion of the previously appointed naming committee. Was that what we talked about? No, but that how like we wouldn't start it for another five years after the eighteen after months. 18 months was so that it, so that after it's, then it would be five years after that, as opposed to five years after it, it starts. Start, yeah. yeah. Because otherwise, every three and a half years, we'd be doing a naming committee for a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do we want to make that change in policy or just make the change now? Uh, for you, if it's a easy grammatical sentence to add <laughs> that we're not going to spend a lot of time crafting, right. we could do it now. Um, Meet every five years upon completion of 18 months term. So. Okay. We can have at it and bring it back. Well, I'll do that. Okay. Okay. And the second was a suggested change I 300 is just a, an edit. Section 5 and 6 reference to South Grove Public Schools, and we just want it to reference North Grove South Grove School District. Uh, so that's a, an edit that we would correct. Well, I think those were the two edits. Yep. Good. So we can we can definitely make that change and then we bring back uh, as a distribution document anyway. Okay. So we want to vote on I140, E180, and I300. Well, I think yes, we do. I move that we that we vote to approve the second readings of policy I140, E180, and I300 with the single edit made <coughs> to I-300 that was discussed. A hearty second. Moved by Paul Becker, seconded by Dan. Any discussion or other questions? All those in favor? That looks unanimous. Thank you. All right, and F-100 will bring back. Yes, next slide. And recommend for rescind. <coughs> 
I310, J290, J310. Recommended for rescinds did not make the new posting. Uh, there was a revised posting that moved up uh, to town hall, so we can bring it back to town hall. Okay. Yeah. So my revised agenda, no, did not make it? We'll make it to town hall. Mm -hmm. So we can just bring it back to town Okay. Good. All right, then the next uh, item on the agenda is audience sharing. Uh, if you are a member of the audience and you'd like to share, uh, I think uh, we would appreciate it if you came up to the area that the camera can get at you, and she's going to give you a, a microphone. Hello, my name Hey, my name is Kristen Loazzo, and I'm a Northboro resident, and I really want to thank you guys for giving me the chance to talk to you tonight. I am not, public speaking is not my forte, so please bear with me, and I have some notes. So my daughter is a junior here at Algonquin, and um, she's had an incredible experience here. Um, she absolutely loves it, and she has taken advantage of the myriad of um, activities that are offered here, and it's been just a awesome experience. Um, but the biggest part of, um, that has made the experience so positive is her participation in the Algonquin Theater Program. Um, she has been part of four musicals here. To be honest, her roles have been um, relatively small. She's been in the ensemble in most of them, but the experience here has been priceless. I don't know if any of the school committee members have had the joy of or privilege of seeing any of the productions, but um, they're great. Uh, there's so much talent in the school and it is just a treat to watch these kids come together, put on just a dynamic show and um, we've really enjoyed it. So she's just one of the many kids here whose passion is theater. They get involved in many things but there's a big group of them whose passion is theater and like I said it's a joy to watch these kids take risks, form friendships that they wouldn't normally um, form, stretch themselves and really grow as individuals as being uh, as a direct result of being part of those Productions. So historically, um, my research shows that Algonquin has offered a fall musical a, as well as some sort of spring theatrical production every year, at least for the last decade, minus a couple years. So I have the list of the productions, uh, the spring productions here. Um, so many students who uh, participated in last year's production of High School Musical, many of those students I know have shared that it has been, it was the highlight of their Algonquin, their time at Algonquin, including college kids that have um, moved on. They still talk about that amazing experience that being part of the spring production here was for them. So you might be asking why I'm here tonight sharing this information with you. So um, I'm here to voice my concerns about attention that has been um, gathering at Algonquin right now with this group of students and beyond. Um, as of now, there's no, there are no plans for a spring production and these kids are devastated. And I wanted to share about that, the uh, pep rally that the athletic director was talking about. And Joan, you mentioned one of the portions of the pep rally was um, the high school kids, the theater kids put together a, a number to kind of encourage the kids to come to the show. It was I think, happening the following weekend. And, a lot of kids came to the show. It was a really, they did Legally Blonde. It was a really good production. And what I, I did hear from parents is my kid never would have thought of doing theater, but after seeing all these kids do it, they're so excited to do a show in the spring, which isn't happening. So like I said, the kids are devastated. Now, we hear about our awesome athletic department here at Algonquin. Can you ever imagine the student athletes coming to administration trying to convince them to please offer us fall sports, winter sports, spring sports? It would never happen. Um, but that's what's happening with these theater kids. Uh, there have been talks and meetings about having one, and I'm perplexed and actually really disappointed that the kids are being put in a position where they have to fight for this opportunity to do something that they love so much. Um, in my opinion, I think that theater kids are being marginalized and being sent a message from the administration that what you in are interested in is important here, and your particular talents are not valued here at Algonquin, and I think that's a real shame. Now, I don't know, like we heard a litany of things from the pre uh, principal that our school offers. So many activities, so many events, and I just am at a loss as why we can't do this for the kids, why we can't provide a spring show for our kids. I, I, I think sometimes things can be more complicated than they need to be, and 
I know that there is a faculty member who has done these shows in the past and is um, willing and able to do another one. So I'm not sure, again, like I said, what the hangup is, but um, I hope you guys change your mind. And, um, you know, these kids are really hardworking. They're really passionate. They want to do what they love. And, you know, especially for the senior's sake, who will not have this chance again. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone here? Joe. Um, I have something <clears throat> just mainly for information purposes only. This was an article that was in the Metro West Daily News online, <clears throat> and it, it just concerns that uh, another district that was going through the same topic as us is on the school start time. So we've heard Boston doing it, and you know, they came up with a plan, and then the public outcry, and then it was shelved. This one is about Wayland. The superintendent had announced to uh, change the start time. Public outcry came. It's now canceled. It's back. It's under for more, for more research. And now the superintendent said nothing is going to change until 2019. It was supposed to happen in fall of 2018. So I think that we're in the same vote as other schools looking for research and the public, you know, you have two sides to the issue, but I just wanted to share this with you that we're in the same position as other schools that is going under the administration and looking at it to make a good, valid decision and listen to both sides of the issue. Thank you very much. Anyone else? There being none. Oh, personnel. Personal mm -hmm. In the Communications, none of this time. Approval of bills and payrolls. I'm sure there are plenty. There are plenty. Lots, Lots of colors. Of colors. <laughs> Agenda <laughs> items for next month. We have F100 policy. And budget. Guidance. And, yes. and uh, exciting, she'll be giving us an update on the Metro West grant program. Excellent. We looked uh, two years ago, we were looking um, at having her come, uh, Lisa come back to talk with us a little bit about the students that the program has served. Excellent. We have a new member presentation as well. Is it yes. <laughs> 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 They, they actually so. present the recommended budget, right? Okay. Um, obviously, if there's any others, then please just forward them to me, Paul. I move that we adjourn tonight's meeting of the North West Central Regional School Committee. A reluctant second. Moved <laughs> <laughs> by Paul Bacca, seconded by Dan. Any comments or questions regarding this item? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Okay. Okay. Okay.